Welcome back to the Sustainability Imperative, and thank you for joining us for Track 4, Leadership in Action. I'm Bob Cusack, the Hills Editor-in-Chief. Over the next hour, leaders from across the public and private sectors will share their hopes and vision for a sustainable planet. But before we get underway, just another friendly reminder to tweet us at The Hill Events using the hashtag, hashtag The Hill Sustainability. We are broadcasting live and we'll be taking your questions. And if you experience any trouble with the live stream, please refresh the page. That should fix it. Uh, investment in clean energy is often presented as an opportunity to create jobs. Uh, here to speak on green jobs and workers is Richard Trumka, president of the AFL-CIO, a federation of 56 national and international labor unions representing 12 and a half million workers. Welcome, Rich. Bob, thanks for having me on. Well, you know, I, my first job in Washington was actually covering uh, OSHA. So I, I've been tracking the labor movement and you uh, for, for quite some time. I first want to get to some news of the day, news of the week. There was this big, uh, as you know, uh, Amazon union vote uh, in Alabama, uh, and Amazon won it. You, you accused Amazon of, of bullying workers. What's your next move on this issue? Well, first of all, we're going to do a deep debrief uh, to see what worked and what didn't work because we're not going anywhere. This is just uh, round one of uh, a mini round fight. Uh, we'll be there to work representing those workers and we'll be coming back. So after we do a deep debrief, then we're gonna bring together a group of people to discuss the best strategy going forward, uh, make a commitment of resources and proceed on uh, to organizing Amazon, bringing a voice to those workers who really do need a voice uh, on the job, Bob. Because the, the main thing that those workers did was they gave voice to what a lot of workers across this country are actually feeling. They're feeling the, the, the brutality of being underpaid and overworked and not respected. Uh, and they really want a voice on the job. In fact, the, a poll today said 73% of workers out there, voters out there believe that unions ought to have a, I mean, workers ought to have a union on the job. Mm -hmm. The PRO Act is, is a big priority for AFL-CIO. It was included, and we're going to talk a lot about it over the next hour in, in President Biden's infrastructure package. Um, are you mm -hmm. confident that this is, A, going to be in the House uh, package, and B, uh, will it survive in the Senate for reconciliation rules? And some people are speculating that the parliamentarian may not uh, allow uh, uh, a straight up and down vote where you could pass it along party lines. Do you think this c can actually be passed the House and Senate and, and be signed into law as part of this infrastructure bill? Well, I really do, and let me tell you why. <clears throat> First of all, our, our labor laws are over 100 years old. Uh, they're totally antiquated. They no longer protect the worker or give a worker a right to, to bargain collectively. They're actually used right now to deny workers that right. Uh, they spend a billion dollars a year, industry does, trying to stop workers from having a voice on the job. And despite all of that, you have a, a president who supports it, a House that supports it, the Senate that supports it, and 70-some percent of the American people support it. We shouldn't let a small majority of people in the Senate prevent that from being law and actually changing the dynamics in the American economy. Because right now, Bob, uh, as we as we sit here and talk to one another, there's a, the any growing inequality in this country is actually a threat to democracy. And when I talk about inequality, I'm talking about inequality of wealth and wages, inequality of opportunity, and mostly inequality of power. You can't fix inequality of wealth and wages and inequality of opportunity until you fix inequality of power. Corporations are too strong and workers are too weak, and the PRO Act would rebalance the scale as it was back in 1935 when the Wagner Act was passed. Uh, it was brought into being so that workers would have as act as a check against corporations. That's simply not happening enough today, and it will happen. I believe that there'll be so much pressure from the American public that ultimately this will become the law of the land. And so, last question on that, you, you think you can get the votes in the Senate, and but more particularly, you, you're going to need every Democrat in the House. Do you think you can get that? Oh, in the House? And, oh, we and already Senate, passed yeah. the House with it. Right, we, no, we I know, and it got House. some Republican support. Um, but yeah, as did. far, 
uh, and as every, far as the every Senate. Every Democrat but one in the House, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. And, do, and do you think you can get them all in the Senate? All the Democrats? Yeah. Okay. I, I think we will eventually get all the Democrats in the House, and I think one way or another we'll get this, uh, it'll become the law of the land because the American public wants it to happen, workers want it to happen, and you would be surprised the number of corporations and businesses that actually want it to happen. You can't operate in, today, in 2021 with the law that was drafted uh, in 1947. Uh, it's antiquated. And it's really out of touch. Green jobs. Everyone's talking about green jobs. Are you worried that the transition uh, to green jobs could could hurt unions? Well, no, not just worker unions, but workers. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go from a twenty-five or thirty an hour, a dollar an hour job down to an eight dollar an hour job, uh, you're going to get hurt. Your community is going to get hurt because the tax base goes away. Your schools are going to get hurt. Your public services are going to get hurt. Everything that's out there. And here's the, the real issue, Bob. If people, if workers see uh, that going to green jobs is really an assault on their way of life or their standard of living, they're going to resist it. And we'll never be able to get the political support that we need to make sure that climate change gets adequately addressed. So what we're saying is those have to become good union jobs. Uh, If you pass the PRO Act, we'll be able to make those green jobs good jobs. And instead of being a threat to to the people in various communities, uh, in coal field communities, oil fields, gas fields, and all of the place where carbon, uh, the carbon footprint footprint will be reduced, instead of being a threat, it'll be an opportunity because it will be an opportunity for them to get to the middle class by having a job that is a job of the future and pays enough to raise them up out of poverty into the middle class. Are you hearing a lot of concern from workers in, uh, from, who have fossil fuel jobs uh, of that nervousness? And isn't that a legitimate concern? Because obviously it's their livelihood. And how do you, how do you handle uh, union members and other workers who, who express that concern to you that they're gonna, they're gonna lose their jobs? Of course it's a legitimate concern. And, and what we're saying is to, to the administration and to everybody out there is, if you're going to make a transition, you have to make a transition in the place and make a commitment of an investment in the areas where the jobs are lost. So that it, if, you, if you lose 100 jobs in Greene County, Pennsylvania, where I grew up and was mine, coal mining was prevalent, gas is prevalent there now, if you lose 100 jobs there, you create 100 jobs in Orange County, California, it doesn't do much for the families in, in Greene County. So what we're saying is you have to match the investment and make a commitment to where the jobs are going to be lost so that we create jobs, those 100 jobs in Greene County and give the people that lost their jobs the skills and, and the opportunity to take those jobs and actually prosper and go, go forward and not be a casualty of the transition. Because if they fear that they're going to be a transition casualty, then they're going to fight it. Mm-hmm. And as I said, we'll never be able to get the political support and mass that we need to get climate change fixed properly unless we commit to a fair transition and the investment in the areas where you're going to lose the jobs. You know, speaking of investment, one of those key components is, is workforce training. Uh, how, how, is, how important is that? And, and how, how, is, that, is that a key to the transition to green jobs? And, and on the ground, what does that mean? What does workforce training really mean? Well, well first of all, let me tell you one of the best kept secrets in the, in the United States, Bob. Uh, other than the military, uh, the, you know, the labor movement in the United States trains more people every year than anybody else out there. Uh, we have apprenticeship programs uh, in, in every facet of construction and manufacturing, uh, in, in hospitality, and we're training people and retraining people to give them more and more and more skills so that they have the skills necessary for the future. Our members are the best trained out there. They provide a very, very efficient workforce. So training is part of it. But even if you have the training, what are you transitioning to? If the job that you're transitioning to and you have all these new skills and you transition to an $8 an hour job, your standard of living has been decimated and people are not going to do that. Why would I spend a whole bunch of time getting new 
new skills if it's going to pay me a third of what I earn today. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make sense. And so that's why we keep talking about the PRO Act and giving people the chance to have bar- collective bargaining so they can bargain with their employers to get a fair share of what they improve, what they produce, and make those jobs good jobs. Because oil jobs, gas jobs, and mining jobs weren't real good jobs when we first started. Collective bargaining made them good jobs. And if we get the PRO Act done so that we can have collective bargaining at the front end of that process, then in fact, those green jobs can become good jobs right at the beginning uh, and offer a real future for us and our communities. Uh, President Joe Biden is, is fast approaching his uh, uh, 100th day uh, in office. And I just want to get you to kind of rate uh, how this uh, White House has reached out to the labor movement, which, of course, is key in, in Democratic Party and, and winning general elections. Uh, how would you rate the, the Biden administration communication uh, to the union movement? Uh, and other than the PRO Act, what would you like to see them pursue the rest of the year? best communications we've had in my lifetime. Uh, Probably the best communications we've had even, perhaps even better than we had with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Because Joe Biden understands the importance that collective bargaining is part of the solution. Uh, You know, I I loved President uh, uh, Obama. I had tremendous respect for him, I still do. Uh, I have uh, tremendous respect for, for President Clinton. But neither one of them really understood the importance of collective bargaining. They surrounded themselves with Wall Street people and they got Wall Street answers and Wall Street solutions. And quite frankly, that's why part of the reason, not just them, because other presidents did it too, but that's part of the reason we're in the pickle where we are right now, where we have growing inequality and that growing inequality actually has put us on a trajectory towards implosion. Uh, And so we have to reverse that. Joe Biden understands that the way to reverse that is to give working people more power on the job uh, and and take away so that we can be a counterbalance to corporations and we can get a fairer share of what we produce into workers' hands. And when you do that, workers then become consumers, they create demand, and that demand creates jobs, and it's a spiral upward, not a spiral downward. Are you confident that uh, minimum wage can be done in some capacity this year because it's kind of been moved off the agenda for now? Yeah, I really am. I mean, it has to be done. Uh, Really, the the minimum wage has fallen so far behind. I think if if we had pegged it for inflation at the first, I think it would be 20 some dollars right now, $24 uh, roughly, uh, instead of the, the 750 where it is right now. And even if you take it up to $15, that's not an outrageous amount of money. That's not going to put you on on easy street. You're still going to fight to get by and hope that you don't have a, a whole lot of uh, unexpected, uh, ex, you know, expenses like a, a storm rips your house, uh, your roof off, so you have to pay for that. Uh, I think we'll get it done. I think most people support it. I think the American public demands it's being done, and those that'll stand in the way, I think, will ultimately get run over. Richard Trumka, we really appreciate the time. Richard Trumka of the AFL-CIO, a lot to talk about, and it's going to be a busy year. Thanks for joining us today. Bob, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the service you do for the country every day. Thank you very much.